This is Coda Radio, episode 224 for September 26, 2016. everyone, and welcome to Coder Radio, Jupiter Broadcasting's weekly talk show, taking a pragmatic look at the art and business of software development and related technologies. This episode is brought to you by our two fine sponsors, DigitalOcean and Linux Academy. I'll tell you more about those great sponsors as this here show goes on. My name is Chris, and joining us every single week, sometimes perched with his Twitter client, is Mr. Michael Dominic. Hello, Mike! Oh ho 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 I like that belly laugh, it's good. Yes, well I've got the belly for it these days. <laughs> That's all that's sitting at the keyboard. That's what it is. No, Tell I think what. it's the bacon cheese fries, but yeah. Oh, oh well that's understandable. Mr. And Dominic, we're gathered yeah. today with a heck of a show. We might I don't know if we're gonna make through all of it. We might not. I guess we could always spill some of it over till next week, but uh, we shall see. About that, bum bum bum. So I made, I started off my day. I'm just gonna just, just because it's on my mind, and then we'll get rolling. I started off my day like a fool. Tomorrow I've got an event down in Seattle. I'm going to, and I, I have audio equipment and video equipment that I need to bring. And of course, I left it at home, which is an hour away. And uh, now, so I've got to drive back home to get all the equipment and drive it back down to the studio to get it all in the chargers and get everything all set up for tomorrow and stage. So. I tell you what, Mr. Dominic, it is one of those days. One of those days. Are, all, all Mondays are those days, Chris. All Mondays are so those days. I, I liked your idea. We got a lot of uh, great feedback that came into the show. We're going we're gonna to double down on some of that, which are going to spin us off into some really great topics. And then towards the end, uh, we're going to do a little roundup of craziness. But um, there is one story that maybe we could start with because it's directly related to uh, platform development and... It's over uh, at muckware.com. It's about the new Mario Run game that probably you all heard about, and it's coming to the iPhone first. And so they did a little digging around and got some quotes that uh, are rather telling that explain why it's coming to iPhone first. They uh, they uh, were in, with an interview with uh, how do you say his last name Minyamoto? I can't remember. I always butcher it. <laughs> Miyamoto. Thank you. That's what it is. Uh, he, uh, they said that uh, Nintendo opted for the iPhone instead of Android to launch Super Mario Run due to the stability of Apple's iOS operating system. One of the reasons, this is a quote, we focused on the iPhone first was the stability of the platform and being able to get the level of response that we wanted out of the games. Uh, then uh, Minyamoto went on to say, uh, and that's not to say Android devices don't have the same level of responsiveness, but because there are so many Android devices, trying to engineer the game to work across all of them requires quite a lot of time. So, in a nutshell, Nintendo made the decision to go iOS first and then work on the Android version in the background. And I don't think there's anything new or shocking or surprising, but if we get towards the end of the show, it's with this in mind that I want to talk about where this could be changing and what's sort of left still to be done for this not to be the case anymore, because this is... This is going to sell some iPhones. I know it sounds stupid, but I really think this is going to sell some, at least people that are on the fence, I think might consider this for a little while. It's, it's, uh, it's an exclusive not because Apple made them some sort of multi-million dollar deal or because Pokemon Go did so well on iOS. It's, it's simply you know, iOS exclusive because there are certain advantages to that platform for developers. That's, I think, a kind of a huge deal. And I know it's not a new topic, so it's hard to yeah. have it resonate. But I, I think it's worth just taking a moment and going, holy shit, this is 2016. This was a massive deal. This would have been huge to launch on Android and iOS day one. There would have been tons of installs. It would have been instantly one of the number one Android apps of all time, especially since it's free with in-app purchase. I just, I can't, this, I think, is a huge loss for Google, even if it's, even if it's just till January or, so, or whenever, you know, however, when it, where do they launch it. It seems, it seems devastating to me that this is still a problem and that I assumed, and this is because I'm a cynic, I assumed that Apple made a backroom deal. He said, hey, you know, the Pokemon yeah, I, Go no, success. I, I, yeah, I made that assumption too. It's interesting that it's not the case. Now, I, I wonder though, so the answer basically is fragmentation, right? Yeah. I wonder if Nintendo isn't particularly uh, 
you know, concerned also about things like frame rate, right? I just, maybe this is my own, you know, prejudice towards Nintendo, where I think that, and a positive prejudice, right? I think they have such a bar for quality, not looking at any of the stuff they've shipped in the last five years, that they wouldn't want something that, hey, it runs on your low-end Android phone, but it's a bit laggy. But that a run game in the realm doesn't. Of possibility. I mean, a run game just doesn't require it. It's not like it's your render. Well, I don't know. Who knows? I haven't seen the game yet, so maybe I shouldn't say. Right. Speak, maybe but. maybe it's three D. I have no idea what the what the specs are. There is some. Yeah, there is something there. So, I yeah, I know that's a problem. But I, I think so. I guess I was going to talk about this later. But it seems like the 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 solution would be for Google to say, to create a tier of Android class devices in via the, like the play API or something that automatically says if you have Vulkan support or something like that or if you have OpenGLS or whatever if you have this version then it automatically it, it automatically is flagged for a certain level of compatibility for app makers to target is that not the case already because my understanding was that was the case but I don't I've never published an app in the Play Store so I have literally no idea but it seems to be an obvious solution so that way uh, Nintendo doesn't have to target Every even even some of the more larger Android devices that are popular, they could just target a certain range of devices that have a certain yeah, CPU but that's, GPU that's not memory. A solution. That's not a solution. When it seems to be Nintendo. the only solution for Android because this is 2016 and they haven't solved the problem yet. And this is a ma- and now they have this massive install base of a billion devices. No, it, it's not right. I mean, you're Nintendo. Many of your customers are kids. You can't. You don't want a situation where you know little Johnny goes to school and little Jimmy has the Mario. I know I'm living in 1950 here and little Jimmy has the uh, Mario game on his Samsung S seven and somehow still has his hands by the way, which is incredible. <laughs> um, and then little Johnny can't get it cause all his mom could afford was the freebie that Verizon gives you. Right. Cause it doesn't it just simply doesn't show in the play store for him. Yeah. That's an awful, awful experience. And if you're a company like Nintendo, you know, they go to, frankly, crazy lengths to avoid children having bad experiences with their products. I I can totally see the argument that, you know what, we can't do some sort of uh, multi, multi-layered multi support or even isn't cut it, off some... Isn't it kind of there already, though? Even if you just look at the fact that there are Asus Android devices running Intel processors, and there's just certain apps that are not available via the Play Store for x86 Android devices. There's already a bit of a split happening. So some people can buy an Android device and not necessarily see the same app that somebody else sees. Yeah, but they're Nintendo, right? That's my point. Yeah, okay. Like, scale. If, if, well, not just scale. It's a brand image thing. Remember, you're dealing with kids. This is a... I mean, I know many of the people who are going to spend money this are not going to be kids. They're going to be our age. But I, I just... I could definitely see a concern that... You know, basically, lower, you know, lower income uh, parents will not have devices for their kids that are strong enough to uh, have Vulcan support. Maybe, maybe I'm overprotective and being a little too, you know, um, you know, too dad-like here. Where I, I just, I just don't think that's a good idea. Yeah, I, mean, I think, think, the think other... about Nintendo. Well, think about their own hardware too. When they release new Nintendo DSs and Game Boys. They always, always have some sort of, uh, like, relatively okay degradation for the cheaper device, right? Where the game will still run, but you may not get, like, the 3D features or something else. Mm -hmm. They never, only when they do a whole new generation do they cut off the old ones. And even then, they tend to still publish watered-down versions on the previous platform. Yeah, the other thing, I guess, too, is the A series of CPUs for like three or four generations now has had really great performance. So you have a kind of a guarantee that a wide range of active iPhones are going to have decent CPUs. Uh, even the, you know, like if you look at the 5S, well, it's kind of getting old, but it's still decent. But the 6 and the 6S are still, you know, they're still, com- they're still competitive with Android devices that are shipping new today. So there's 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 a good like three or four year range where you know your game's gonna get a decent frame rate and a decent performance level, a decent launch time. Um, it does it does make sense, and that's why I think if if Google could abstract that a little bit and say, well, don't think of it in terms of a single device. Think of it in terms of devices that are flagged to have these APIs or devices that are flagged to have this hardware. If they could, I just think if they could make a transition like that, it might make it possible for games like this to launch on Android first. I don't know. It seems like a, it's, it seems like a, I guess Wait. I'm the only I feel like I'm also maybe the only person that cares anymore, but it still kind of seems like it seems like a pretty big platform deal. 
I don't know. I oh, mean, it is I, 2016, and we're still waiting for that ma- that major Android app that launches Android first. You don't think that's a big deal? You don't think that's weird that it hasn't been solved yet, that that's still a thing? Well, I think that that was 2010, 2012. That's why it boggles my it, mind that it is still a problem. Like, Google has not gotten their crap together on the fragmentation issue, at least as far as developers like Nintendo are concerned. I'm not even trying well, to be even, on a soapbox here. I just think it seems legitimately for, like even a problem. Even for non-game apps, right? They yeah. have the compatible with your device thing, which basically goes through yes. um, and checks the, the feature requirements that you list in your manifest. So, for instance, if your app requires a camera and it says so in the manifest, uh, it will not. Right. It will show in the store, but it will not be downloadable for the user, I believe. So It will yeah. say not compatible. Or if you have, like me, an array of devices and some are and some aren't compatible, it'll kind of show you a menu and, like, gray them out. Mm, uh, yeah, that I have seen, yeah. That's awful. I mean, we're, we're in, in okay, the I area get your of, point like, there, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that, right. that's... Point made. I, that's a yeah. horrible, yeah, it's a horrible experience. Okay, well, then I guess... Okay, I just I was I would be really like to see that problem solved. Um, but why don't we t- while we're talking about uh, Android development, why don't we talk about something that uh, Kitty sent submitted into mm-hmm. the show? Dart as a Java substitute for Android development. Hello, everyone. Now I know that Mike has been speculating that Google could move their Android SDK to Swift SDK to Swift from Java. I think I think I don't. Were you one hundred percent serious about that? I guess you did speculate about it. But well, what about Dart? We- we uh, we covered a, a couple of stories yeah. on it, right? That yeah. they were like internal. Google yes, projects. I do remember that. Google has uh, been pushing Dart pretty heavily, even though it's not yeah. not a lot of people use it. It's similar to Java in philosophy. In fact, one of its goals is to was to improve some of Java's shortcomings. If they optimize the VM enough, and considering that mobile devices are getting more and more powerful, this could probably be a problem that is solved. They already have Flutter, which uses Dart. So, what do you think? Is it a sure. possibility? What are your thoughts? So, you know. When Dart came out, it was more of a TypeScript, CoffeeScript competitor. Um, I think, in fact, almost 50 episodes back, probably more than that, actually, we had a show about JavaScript and going through all the uh, JavaScript compile into languages, right? So languages that were something else that can compile into JavaScript. I'm noticing that Dart isn't super popular, <laughs> Um, and a lot of the places where Dart was trying to be successful, which was basically web development and general application development, TypeScript has pretty much one. Um, Angular 2 is written in TypeScript, right? Ang- uh, TypeScript is a first-class citizen on Angular and Ionic and a number of other platforms. I don't think it makes sense for Google to... to right off the bat, I don't think it makes sense for them to do anything with the Android SDK. Switching languages is a huge hassle. There's a lot of legacy code out there. And I would make the argument that the dynamics of Android development are very different than the dynamics of iOS development. A lot less consumer stuff, a lot more enterprises with large code bases. And some sort of transition would be painful. Now, let's just stipulate for the sake of argument that they are going to transition to something. I have no idea why they would pick Dart. Um, You know, they have another language called Go, which probably makes a lot more sense on a performance perspective. Although, you know, Java's not too bad itself. But let's, you know, take it a step further. Let's say they do transition. Are they then going to rewrite the platform? And, 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 And I don't mean to just throw like a total wrench into this question, but why not Go? Why? Why would we not? Why would we be assuming Dart? Well, or that's Go? what I said. They they own Go, right? Go is their language. Yeah. Go would make more. So sense. why? So why not? Why, that seems. I mean, Dart is. Yeah. Okay. I guess it's interesting. But here's. I guess why not Go? Well, Go is more popular too, right? Well, Go, Go is far more successful as an open source uh, language project than than Dart. Really. So I'll is. tell you why not Go. This is this is my point. So here's why I think not Go. I mean, who knows? But why did Google choose Java to begin with? They chose it because it was massively popular. Lots of built-in developers. In fact, we know this by the emails that were released during the Oracle lawsuit. Google plainly chose Java simply because there was a built-in developer base they could take advantage of and hit the ground running. So yeah. if there was a if there was another open source language they could have enough oversight or at least enough insurance policy with as you know, I use that term loosely. If there was something like that that met that, that had a huge user base that was an industry standard that tons of people knew that had a built-in developer base, yeah, I think they might consider switching to that. But otherwise... All right, but, uh, you know, just I'm going to riff off uh, Make Hexel Great again in the chat because I think he's right, which is something I'm probably not going to say about somebody else who wants to make things great again tonight. It, it, 
if I was to, you know, be Google King for a day, because I forgot the CEO's name. I think it's Larry Page still, right? Or just, no, Sundar Pichai. Yeah. Thank you. I would look at Android and say, if there's one thing I can fix, it's not Java, because I don't think Java is broken. I would, it's not even like Project Butter, or whatever this year's version of Project Butter was called. We've been doing Project Butters, margarine, butter, olive oil, whatever you want to call it. I would really rein in these uh, OEMs to the point where I think I would just compete directly with them and basically try to put them out of business. Oh, see now, okay, now listen, now, now listen. This is exactly where they're going. They got they got the Google right. Pixels. It's we, almost a well, lot at this point. Well, the leaks all came out today, right? Mm-hmm. Today was Google leak day. I mean, but yeah. you know, Google's problem is that they have what I would consider a disloyal group of partners, right? Samsung, I mean, I've hated Samsung for a long time. I've tried to be a little more open-minded, but let's be honest, Samsung are just Korean knockoffs, right? Like that's what they are. <laughs> they did a good job. Uh, recently trying to build a brand and then they blew off some kids hands so yeah and did you hear that the replacement devices know, are discharging when you charge them right they're also screwed up and they don't work yeah oh boy time. that's a so I uh, you know Google right get into bed with people who build quality not just crap that they ship over from Asia cheap now I understand Apple's just as bad this is because. never gonna work this is never so look the the leaks are and Android oh, yeah, yeah. Android Police says they have a they have a certainty of nine out of ten on this. I think is is this the one where they have a certain, yeah. Yeah, oh six out of ten. So they, yeah. it's a mid level confidence level, uh, but they say that uh, the Pixel phones are going to start at six hundred and four six hundred forty nine dollars fifty. IPhones, yeah, seven hundred. I will brand new iPhone seven starts at what six fifty seven hundred. Yeah, but the iPhone has a nine year brand legacy that they have built up. This is and that's my point. They have allowed Samsung. I mean, I would say HTC, but HTC actually made good project products and got demolished. They would. They allowed Samsung to effectively own the brand. Yes, but so so I they mean, how 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 okay how do you get from that problem to they're gonna they're, Google's gonna click its uh, heels together and all of a sudden it's gonna ship a device that consumers want that's never happened they they've done the Nexus line for so long and they've never gotten consumer awareness raised they, remember the first couple phones they actually did try to sell it to Joe Public remember they actually did try and then uh, by the later on they just realized it was a geek phone and they dialed it way back uh, this six hundred they so so you know how they you know how they say they're gonna get people to swallow this pills they're gonna do a financing deal as well. They say they're going to do pixel financing. Which is what Apple does, though, yep. right? Yeah. I mean, just very, very successful for Apple, by the way. So this is what I don't understand. Google, you know, go hire a bunch of industrial designers. It's it's not just that, though. That go make deals with the carriers and, and simply cut them off. Yes, I agree that's what they should do. But Google has yet to ever ship a phone that has the best in- – They've never shipped anything best in class on Android. They've never just been copy. They could just clone the iPhone. They've I mean, like their, the their camera experience is clunky and slow on the oh, Nexuses. Yeah, so, so the software, right? The software is kind of a different. But I mean, Google Allo, I don't think it's a particularly interesting app, but it's a very. Have you used it yet? Yeah, it's, it's a very beautiful app. It's super. It's super. Uh, oh, Allo. No, I did Duo. I have not tried Allo. Oh uh, yeah. Uh, maybe I'm thinking of Duo, the chat one. No, Allo yeah, the, is yeah. Allo is the messenger is, one that has the yeah. AI bot that reads all your yeah. stuff, and Duo is supposedly the end-to-end encrypted video chat. See, I think I think that's the issue with Google. They're making their money on the data, so they kind of didn't care, and it never made sense for them to possibly, you know, wade into the muck, so to speak. But I don't know. Maybe, maybe this is see. This is where I'm channeling my old man Donald Trump here because I'm just. You know, there are plenty of other phone manufacturers that the fact that you have relied on Samsung and they have proven what they are is kind of shocking to me. I don't I mean, know. History, I, I think, history. see, I think you are, I think you are, a, so you, you are not assign, assigning enough blame to Google in this. So this was a tweet by Cassidy James, one of the elementary OS developers, and uh, he makes a point that this is a, this is a fresh install of of Google's uh, Android OS, there are one, two, three, four chat programs by default. There are two mapping applications. There are two payment applications. There are two mail clients. There are two news readers, Play Newsstand and Play News. There are t- there's two YouTube clients. Uh, plus, there's Play Movies and Play Music and Play Books. 
They're, they they are doing too. They are too fragmented internally too. They're doing. I don't think this company has what it takes to deliver a seven hundred dollar smartphone that can compete with the S seven or can compete with the iPhone. I just don't. I don't think they have it, and that's so, why Samsung ran away with it. Because I think it's hardware design that's really their Achilles heel. Um, no, because you, you're, you're not. You're not considering the fact that it's the carriers that are buying these phones and selling them to the customers, and the carriers are looking at the experience and saying, "This is a better experience for average consumers. We want this Samsung phone with this Samsung shitty UI on it." Is that is that what they're saying? Yes, or I think is it is. Samsung paying their sales reps incentives to sell Samsung. Phones, no carriers is, looking at the Nexus line and going, "Man, they've really nailed the user experience." Because they with the don't Nexus. make anything on it. They, well, the, the stock Android experience, I think, is actually pretty nice. The problem is, is it's not refined. Do, what, what does that have to do with their balance sheet at the end of the quarter that you think it's nice? The problem is, is the carrier, there is somebody at the carriers making the decisions which phones to right. buy, and they're and not you know, choosing. You know, no, no. There's somebody in the store making a decision of which phone she or he is going to show you. And if Samsung's yeah, yeah, giving yeah, some sort yeah, of oh, yeah, that's true. That's incentive, true. that happens but all nobody's, the time. But nobody at the upper, upper levels of the carrier has decided to put the Nexus line of phones in the years that they've been making Nexus lines in the store. And Google tried really hard to get Verizon to do it for a couple of years. I don't I don't I don't think, you know, Verizon CEO is sitting up there being like, No, I don't, I don't think know, it goes man. that high up. This, no. this Nexus six is just so hard to use. Uh can we get Samsung on the line? Can they do something? A little touch with uh, so you've got, something? I mean you've got see here's the thing is you've got uh you've got so you got You've got all this this mishmash of apps that would ship on this Pixel phone. It, I, I would imagine it would be some sort of Google Experience phone at seven hundred dollars, probably built by HTC or somebody like it. And then and then next year you get the Pixel laptop, which isn't running the same version of Android as the Pixel phones. So in Q three twenty seventeen, and this is one where they say they're super locked in on on the predictability. Uh, the, the Andromeda project ships, which is an entirely different. It's like some combined version of Chrome yeah, OS and Android. That, that's what Google needs. Another operating system. Isn't that incredible? Like, so, and, and 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 just confuses the Pixel branding even more. I, I I don't think I don't think they have it. I don't think this is the solution right, let, to the let, problem. Let, let me challenge you here All right. a little bit. Go ahead. Because you want, I want to assign blame to the carriers and to the hardware manufacturers, and, and you want to assign it effectively to Google. Well, no carriers and Google. Okay, so in your world, there's no good guy here. It's just an array of, of rogues galleries, so to speak. Yeah, I suppose a bunch of a bunch of people that are all trying to make you know trying to get the best cut for themselves, trying to trying to make a decision. That's what it feels like. Then why don't you go on the Linux Action Show and recommend everybody just buy an iPhone? I think it's up to the individual person here. Actually, I uh, I, 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 I mean, have by said your argument, Android is an inferior product in almost every way. I have made an argument with Noah that uh, I don't feel comfortable using a Samsung device simply because Android Android N has shipped. So here's two things: Android N has shipped, and his phone doesn't have it. So well, there are fixes yeah. that he has not getting. Plus, he's not getting the monthly Google security updates. So he's walking around with a kernel that is currently vulnerable to a man-in-the-middle attack. He's walk and these are all like documented. I could go through a whole list. There's documented bugs in the version of Linux that is on that handset. That bothers the hell out of me as somebody who is aware of these things, and it feels because like malpractice on Samsung. The and it's not just Samsung, even though I particularly don't like the way they've handled this. Uh, people have been hurt with this battery issue. All these manufacturers are not making – there was a chart that came out, what was it, a year, six months ago about the reason no one's doing Android phones very well other than Samsung is because basically no one's making money. Sure. It's a, it, it is a, a horrible business. Only, there's only one company that makes money on phones, and that's Apple. I just want to, I mean, Samsung makes some money, but I mean, significant profit margins, yeah, right? Yeah. Now, that's because they have scale and, and some sort of, uh, you know, operational advantages. But I feel like there's something here, and I feel like we could do a whole show on it, and I'm just going to throw down one more gauntlet and let the, let the subreddit explode this week. Windows Phone 7 and 8 were better operating systems than Android, by far. From a user ease of use perspective, from actually not from doing what I want it to do mm. and not spying all my stuff, yes. The hardware was far nicer until they started deciding to build crappy phones. So I'm talking the uh, HTC 8, the M8, and the um, uh, all the Nokias, basically, except for the low-end ones that came later when they failed. Yet, guess who screwed Windows Phone? Mm. The carriers. They just said, oh, you don't want that. There's no apps. 
And they yeah, when you're actually you. in the store, you're right. Yeah, when you're, no, yeah, yeah, and, yeah, and yeah. Mom yeah. and pop yeah. art. Yeah. So the, I mean, we we could we could go on a whole whole thing about my distaste for some of these. Uh, let, let me put it to you this way: though I don't think you can patent rounded red corners, I really, really wish the courts had been much harder on Samsung. <laughs> Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. You know, maybe that boy in New York would still have his hands. Just saying. <laughs> no, right. I'm not kidding, right? Yeah, I guess you might be rewind, right. Rewind 30 years, and Samsung was knockoff American products. Yes. What are they today? But knockoff American products with some lipstick and very, very sexist uh, trade shows. Mm, yeah, they do have the worst, don't they? Wow, this yeah, turned into a Samsung bad. hate hour, and I, I guess wow. you know I, I have owned a Samsung phone, and I did like it for a while. So I don't, I don't discourage anybody. For, get, get whatever you want. All of us have different requirements for a phone, so that's my. You know what? You know what? Make RCA great again. Woo! LinuxAcademy.com slash coders. That's where you go to support the show and learn more about the Linux Academy platform. A platform built by Linux enthusiasts, educators, and developers who really love Linux. That's why it's not just a bullet point about their site. It's what their site is. The fundamentals, all of the core technology, plus all of the awesome badass stuff built on top of it. The stuff that makes you money, the stuff that you want to have on a resume, the stuff your clients need you to know when you're getting in, into a big job. If you have something that's uh, like I do, a little bit of test anxiety, Linux Academy has the tools for you. I love this. They have hands-on labs where you get real scenario-based experience so you can go into the test and feel like you're going to perform. They also have learning paths, which are series of courses and content planned by instructors. They have mentoring from instructors when you need it. It's a really great system. Check it out at linuxacademy.com slash coders. And a big thank you to Linux Academy for sponsoring the Coder Radio program. And just in time for the Linux Academy spot, uh, the uh, Weed Whackers showed up. That was uh, just wonderful. Thanks, guys. That's good. Mm -hmm. So this was an item that was passed along via that subreddit at uh, coderadio.reddit.com. It's called codemade.io, and the uh, cute, adorable tagline is Pinterest for developers. This is kind of neat. Yeah, it's kind of cute, right? A bunch of Raspberry Pi and Maker projects. Yeah, and some beer stuff. So, of course. I mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is actually this over here looks kind of cool. Temperature humidity monitor with blink. Man, they're like they Wait, they work like right behind the studio. These weed whackers. They just stand behind the studio. I tell you what. How many times have police sirens been on the air while I've been? Uh, yeah, it's, it's ambiance. Yeah. You know, it's real, Mike. It's real. That's what it is. Well, I'm reporting from downtown Camden, apparently. Do, do, so do, 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 do. I could I could throw in some helicopter effects. Yeah, this is yeah. actually pretty neat, and there's. Quite yeah, a bit it's of cool. It's kind of hilarious how close they are. A lot of lot of Raspberry Pi stuff. Yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah. Have you played with it? Yeah, I have one. I actually, I also have a BeagleBone Black. Um, I like the BeagleBone better, but the pricing makes it. I understand why people go with the Pi. Mm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. The pies are and the pies are plentiful. You can get them on Amazon real quick most of the time and stuff like that. Well, there was uh, there was one cool. I mean, we've never talked about this, but I also did a little project with the Intel Edison chipboard. Oh yes, I have. Yes, yes, yep. Two yep, years back. Yeah. Yep, yep. I thought that was that was actually my favorite set. Yeah, it was like 130 bucks though. But you got it a whole. Expensive, you got a whole x86 you a, system. You got a whole kit. You could throw an x86 OS on it. I put Windows 10 on it. Cause I'm horrible. Monster. Um, I am a monster. Hey, just be happy I didn't put underscore or what is it? Lowercase Mac, uppercase OS, on it. Oh yeah, that just came out, didn't it? Did, okay, well, go ahead. No, I don't update production machines and yeah, I don't until do I have to. Yeah, I, I, uh, as my production machine here, we have one Mac in the studio here that's running ten point nine. I don't even know how many uh, versions out of date. You know what? They had to pry Snow Leopard from my very, very stubborn hands. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And meanwhile, in Arch, I'm updating every single day. Bring it, give it to me, give it to me. I don't know what the difference is. You're works. nuts. Oh, my uh, mouse issue that I was complaining on Ubuntu. Mm, oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, it turns out there was a piece of a peanut that I was eating peanuts and having beer while I was coding uh, that got <laughs> under the pieces of the mouse. <laughs> so nice. I took a playing card and took it out, and now Ubuntu works. So that was the the error was between the uh, user and the keyboard in this particular case. That's it's cool. always the user. Let's so be honest. tell me about your camel toe, because I don't know much about Apache Camel. Uh, an Apache Camel has met Spring Boot apparently, which yeah, is so exciting. Apache Camel. Um, we don't need to go into it too much, but. You use it with Spring Boot. It it does routing and oh, I'm smelling some Java stuff. eight stuff here too. Yeah, oh, okay. that's where we're going with this. Uh -huh. You know, we've been talking about Swift. We've, for some reason, people keep emailing about Dart. A uh, lot of Rust love. A lot of little bit of TypeScript that we haven't really covered it. What about Java eight? No. Java eight's been actually doing awesome. Yeah, how come? How come is it? Is it just that uh, it's like the plumbing? You never talk about your pipes. 
I don't know. I think it's been well, but there's a lot new. There's lambdas. There's a little bit of a uh, reflection stuff in there. If you want to be all fancy, I think it actually has been overshadowed by like the new sexiness of Rust and Swift and insert random language I haven't heard of here. Hmm. Yeah, the Swift gets a nice boost from the tech press simply because the tech yeah. press kind of understand what it is. Well, and it has that nice bird logo. I I, I really think that helps. <laughs> I'm only half kidding. You know, you might be onto something there, actually, because uh, that's why you I always, always keep need a header image. I always keep always. an eagle around, just for oh. that. Yeah, just for that purpose. Yeah. So you know, in, in it's not so long of being in production and done. Java eight is already you know a reasonable default for Android. Um, you can use it in Apache Camel, Spring Boot, all these other sorts of platforms. I mean, really, all of Spring. It doesn't have to be Spring Boot. Java Play. And no one's really talking about it other than some really poorly designed websites for Java developers, which of course makes sense because they're Java developers. See what I did there? I like it. I like it. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to make a statement here. Bring it, girl, bring it. Hey, girl, Java 8 brings a lot of the features that the functional programmers wanted, like Lambdas. What happened to Scala? (laughs) Last time you heard about Scala. Uh, last time I heard about it, the last time you brought it up on the show, I think. <laughs> exactly. I, I'm starting to very tangentially notice that a lot of folks are kind of coming back and saying, oh, well, Java 8 does that anyway. You know, hmm. maybe that's the way to go. Generic collections, all kinds of fun hmm. stuff with collections. Hmm. I, w- I would encourage you, if you're one of those people who's like, I'm too cool for Java, I write Swift and I want to make Xcode great again. Uh, go ahead and take a look at Java 8. It will, I think, be pretty interesting to you. Now, have you noticed specific projects or is something specifically caught your attention that's using Java 8? Because I don't know if I hear about so, that much. What caught my attention was that uh, without even noticing it, I've been using it for over two months in Android. Oh, damn. Okay. And someone posted this uh, Apache Camel thing in the subreddit. And I was like, oh, yeah, you can use it on Spring Boot with no problems now. Hmm. That is pretty uh, cool. Yeah, someone's asking, did Java 8 fix null like Scala did it? Uh, no. You still have to catch null pointer exceptions. So that is the one area where Java is a bit verbose, right? If the mandatory exception catching. I Personally, I like my code to crash in production. That's how I am. That's why, that's why we recommend the use of PHP. Ah. Uh. So speaking, so speaking of uh, sponsors, uh, these crazy guys over at uh, Buccaneer Tech Inc. Uh, are, uh, are, and I haven't seen a sponsor this week, and I, I think this is kind of cool. It's somebody we talked about last week. Yes. Code Vapor. Yeah, we are, we are sponsoring uh, Vapor.codes, which is really just called Vapor, which is a <laughs> development framework. Although, I, I, you know, bonus points for getting the .codes domain. That's Yeah, that is. Yeah, good. yeah. Just see. I may have been r- 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 wrong. I think Swift on the server could make sense. So you changed your mind and uh, threw down a little sponsorship. Now, where, where, Mr. Where, where, Mr. Dominic, do you think this is going? Where? So here's how I changed my mind, because I All think right. that's a little helpful. I was playing with it and doing a couple kind of skunk work, see, hey, let me see if I could get a Swift server running on my Raytel. Because, you know, when I think Swift... I think Ubuntu Linux. I don't know about you guys. Everybody else does. Is that not a native platform? (laughs) Because it compiles natively. I think Johnny Johnny Ive uh, compiles uh, all of his Swift uh, code on Linux, I believe, specifically. I think if Johnny Ive ever saw the Unity desktop, he would go home to England and murder some UI designers. (laughs) He'd hunt down Mark Shuttleworth personally. (laughs) (laughs) He'd be like, all right, I'm going to (laughs) fuck you. (laughs) Uh, yeah, you guys got to work on that a little bit. Um, so, you know, I was doing a bunch of skunk worksy things, trying it out, because Rails is uh, going in a direction that I'm not sure I love, though I don't hate it. And we're at this transition of having to possibly go to Rails 5 soon for everything, which isn't as horrible as that might sound. But there's a lot of things I'm not super happy about it with Rails. You know, I've mm-hmm. tried out Go, I've tried out Node, which I just just don't like Node. Uh, I've tried out various Python solutions, but they're so Rails-esque that what's the point? Things I'm looking for in a new web framework, you know, long walks on the beach, better performance than Ruby. Of course. Uh, less ceremony. That So that's a huge one for me. Mm-hmm. Less ceremony and significantly less black magic. Hmm. 
like something fun that happened in the office today. Do you know that string dot strip without an exclamation point uh, will return the value of the strip string? So what strip does in Ruby is mm. it cuts off any blank characters at the beginning or end, right? It removes them. But if you put a exclamation point at the end of it, it will return the, let me get this right, the value of the characters it cut off. So if there were no uh, empty characters, it returns nil, which so, is. So they say why on this the the uh, the Vapor Twitter feed links to a blog post is talking about uh, server side languages compared to Python or Ruby. It's super fast and a type safe yeah. language. It's a yep. language al- which allows developers to write expressive code. As an iOS developer, you can stay in the same technology stack. If you need to develop a web service for your iOS app to retrieve data, you can write that in the same language using the same tooling. And devs love Swift, which always kind of makes me a little nervous. That being one of the rules to run something on servers because devs love it. But uh, the you can write you can write that you can write your iOS and server side stuff in the same language. That's what I was saying last week. Is why I actually thought it, it, Vapor is actually kind of a good idea. Is I could honestly see, and I use I always use this example, but I could honestly see somebody's creating an iOS app today or some something like an Uber or an Overcast that has a huge, massive yeah. back end. Why why wouldn't you do this possibly as long as it's so- solid? As long as it's solid. So real-time follow-up. Um, obviously, I misspoke. If you do the uh, amp- the amp- God damn it, exclamation point at the end of strip, it returns either the strip string or nil, nil if there's nothing to strip, mm. just so we don't get 400 emails. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I, I'm going to take this a step further, right, because they're obviously saying iOS developers would, would use this. I kind of think that it makes sense even on a wider appeal. You know, if it can be getting a, a vapor app set up is actually pretty fast and pretty lean. It runs fairly quickly, though, you know, my speed tests Jeez. are they claim a yeah. hundred X faster than Ruby or PHP. Frameworks, yeah, frameworks. And seventy five percent of all statistics are made up. I know, but, but even if it's hundred even if it's X, like two X, yeah. that's that's great. I'll take it. Yeah, right. Yeah. I, I'm I'm starting to come around to the Swift stuff. I mean, I'm hoping that they honor their promise of not breaking things from Swift three to Swift four. But it makes a lot of sense, especially the way this uh, framework seems to work. And I th- I'm going to cover it more on the show as it goes. It's a little immature right now, so it's not something I would ship in production. But you know, it is not hard to get a uh, get a Docker or Doku image ready to go and deploy this to a DO droplet. Right. It really isn't. Uh, and it runs pretty fast, and it works as they brag about what most databases you would probably want to use, i.e. Postgres, Mongo, MySQL. Great. Yeah, it feels like... Um it feels like we're now living in an era where uh, there's an infrastructure where if you, okay, so to me as a as somebody who ra- used to run a bunch of systems running a whole bunch of different web apps, it would be crazy to me that you wouldn't be able to just go down to the file system, vim a, a PHP file, make a quick uh, syntax fix, restart Apache, and good to go. The problem has just been fixed on production. You'd never really want to do it, but every now and then you did that, and it was a real simple fix because you know it's just all right there in plain English for you to read and fix. This is not really going to be the case anymore with Swift server-side applications. However, at the same time, there's such an infrastructure in place for build and testing and deploying to production that there's so many systems people can use. Like it just it feels like a totally different era now of, of, of back-end web application servers. It just It's beyond anything we've really seen before. Well, wow. Did you get like an advertising fee for that? What? No, I just mean like it's 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 more along the lines of of Java and less along the lines of PHP or Ruby. So I don't well, think the comparisons well, okay. are necessarily so, so fair. That's a fair point, right? Because Swift is actually compiled. Right. So the reason it's likely so much faster is it's straight up compiled. Right. So I don't know if I mean when you compare it to Ruby or PHP, that's like well, it's Ruby not... and PHP are both interpreted. Yeah, so but I know so that's why I'm saying so it's that's... not an apple. It's not an apples to apples compar- uh, comparison. Probably not just in speed, but also probably not in functionality. It's still totally valid that it's way faster and can do tons of stuff. But you wouldn't necessarily use PHP or Ruby. Well, you could actually use definitely. Okay, I'm not could. sure why you wouldn't. I mean, I mean, I see Vapor as being something I would replace. You know, if I'm using Rails five and just using the API functionality, meaning that the client is its own web app or an iOS app or Android app, I'm not sure why I wouldn't 
consider using vapor for that once it's a little more mature. Right? No, to be clear, to stop the Reddit hate mail, no one is saying that you should use this today in production. But you got to start at some point the work. It's on. going in the right direction, I think. Now they could do something crazy and, and stupid, and you know, talk about omasake and all that kind of nonsense. Okay, but so could Django, and so has Rails. I feel like there is a, this is a, the right time to do it, and because there is a lot of interest in Swift, you, you, it's worth experimenting with and seeing where it goes, right? Well, Swift in general is is really something we haven't seen before, where it's got a lot of backing both from its vendor and from IBM. Uh, I don't know how successful IBM is being at selling Swift consulting services. I think they, I, they I, claim it's successful. It's almost yeah, unbelievable. The, the level of success almost seems unbelievable, like it's rigged. Well, it, they must be selling it as a package is the only thing I can think. Because, you know, I would not – I mean, I, even .NET services, right? It's very hard to convince someone to rewrite their Access web application, right, that's just talking to Access in anything that makes sense. Because rewriting doesn't provide business value immediately. Agreed. So I, I just I just can't really believe how IBM could be out there selling Swift unless they're selling it as part of like the IBM, you know, Apple tablet app package and it's something that just works. But a year down the line, I could see Vapor, you know, being one of the when you Google, hey, I'm a new dev and I want to, you know, check out a web development framework. Right up there at Rails and Django, right? Hmm. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe maybe the Rails community and some of these other bigger web development communities are are that entrenched now that they're not going to go anywhere. No, if anything, I would just think that uh, somebody else using Swift will come along and try to accomplish something. That, you know, what was the well, per- it, wasn't there the perfect or I can't remember. Uh, no, there's perfect. Right there, yeah. there are a few. Vapor is the biggest one. Um, it's also one of the older ones. Uh, I think Vapor has a little more maturity. Ah, so there's. There, yeah, there probably is more mo- more momentum there as well. But anything could happen, right? I mean, anything could happen. I do have some concerns about the Swift language itself. I mean, the thing I just complained about as the chat room is right to yell at me is actually a feature of Ruby. I just think it's a stupid feature. So <laughs> <shouldn't exist. clears throat> before we go too much further off of the topic, you did mention in there that one of the things that Vapor does is that they have an icon right on there for DigitalOcean. It's really cool yeah. to experiment with this technology. So use our promo code over DigitalOcean. It's coder digital one word, and you'll get a $10 credit. It's a great hosting. You can spin up uh, droplets all over the world in Amsterdam and London and Toronto and Germany and New York and San Francisco and India. They have a great infrastructure with block storage so you can just increase your storage as you need it. And they have hourly pricing so when you're doing your dev work, you can start at a really reasonable price. Like a really nice rig is three cents an hour and you can just flip that into production. Their pricing, if you want to go monthly, is really straightforward and reasonable. It starts at $5 a month. Use our promo code Coder Digital, you get the $10 credit. And also, I want to encourage you to visit their documentation. They have an introduction to string methods in Python 3 up right now. Uh, it was just published uh, just a few days ago. Also published a little bit longer ago, but not too long ago, how to secure GitLab with Let's Encrypt on Ubuntu 16.04. Both things that are wonderful on DigitalOcean, not necessarily unique to DigitalOcean, but ne- so this documentation may be valuable if you just want to check out DigitalOcean, see their services, and read these. But if you already have a droplet, not only are they crazy easy to spin up with their great UI and their straightforward API, but they have documentation that allows you to take it even further. Really good stuff, professionally edited by editors in the company. Check them out at DigitalOcean.com and use our promo code, Coder Digital, DigitalOcean.com. And a big thanks to DigitalOcean for sponsoring the Coder Radio program. And by the way, when you're using Coder Digital, if you want to go nuts, if you want to burn through that $10 and have a good time doing it, check out their high memory droplets. Now this is really cooking with gas. 224 gigabytes of RAM, ranging from 16 gigs up to 224 gigabytes. And I, I, to give you an idea, with a 224 gigabyte rig, which is $2.50 an hour, which is not that bad at all for that, 32 core processor, 500 gig SSD, and 10 terabytes of transfer. You could probably find something to do with that. DigitalOcean.com, use our promo code, Coder Digital. And a big thank you to DigitalOcean for sponsoring the Coder Radio program. I'm really proud of you and impressed you have not brought up the debates that are impending tonight at all. It's all the chat room wants to talk about. And you've made a few jokes, a couple of comments, but uh, your girl's up on stage tonight and you haven't said anything. Uh, uh, no, my, 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 my girl? Yeah, Katy Perry, Katy Perry. 
Oh, she's on stage tonight. No, tonight. I'm just I was talking about Hillary. Oh, oh, <laughs> I was just throwing you. I know, oh, I just throwing you for that's, a loop. That's not very. You nice. know, I'm, I'm tempted. Uh, I'm tempted to do it live tonight, but I don't know. I uh, I don't know. I'm tempted to cover the to cover the debates live and just offer a little commentary as we go. But we'll see about that. We'll see. Did you okay? So before we get out of here, did you see that the new Nexus phones were also? Uh, or I guess I shouldn't call them that, but the new Pixel phones were also leaked in a Nest ad. And uh, so this is kind of confirming yeah. the other leaked images we've seen. They have some interesting sensors on the front. I think it might be for the VR stuff because these are supposedly going to be uh, the uh, Daydream VR compatible headsets. Could be coming out October fourth, Mr. Dominic. That's the rumored release date. Are you tempted at all? I mean, I know you just got a new phone, so you're kind of you're kind of locked in now. But no, I, I think I'm good. I uh, yeah, I don't think I'm tempted. I mean, unless there's a reason I need it as a test device, but to be honest, I'm living in the magical world of 4.4. So. Right, and I feel like my Nexus 6P, will, uh, will I still have that, and I will still use that as an Android test device probably for a while. It seems like it should be a relevant device for still quite a while. Um, but I'd be, Dude, I'm, I'm using first-gen Nexus 7s. Yeah, I liked my Nexus 7 a lot. I ended up giving it to my grandpa, but I ended up really, I yeah. really liked that. I thought that was yeah, a decent yeah, tablet. It was a decent tablet, and I, I mean, we don't need to hate on Android more than we already have, but there's... No, not much of a compelling reason to upgrade, I think, but... Yeah, perhaps so. I Yeah, I don't I don't actually, you know, it sounds like we haven't cut it down on Android, but I actually still, there's still elements of my 6P I enjoy quite a lot. Um, I guess, uh, I, as a quick aside before we go, I've been slowly experimenting with replacing Google Now. That's one of the things mm. I actually kind of liked about uh, the, the Nexus Google launcher thing. Mm was uh, when you swiped all the way over to the left, you got the Google Now feed, and they had, like, my calendar stuff, emails, important reminders, uh, deliveries, and weather, and traffic, and um, news. And I've been using uh, iOS 7 widgets, or no, I mean iOS 7, iOS 10 widgets, um, now to sort of rebuild that Now feed, and I like it a lot. And none of it is tied into any Google services, and it works quite well. It's been, it's been a pretty cool experience to sort of rebuild a Google Now feed. Uh, using widgets, which I generally don't right. really spend much time thinking about, but I've actually spent like about four bucks on widgets. But now I all have I have my own custom feed that is uh, sourced by my own RSS feeds and stuff like that that I supply to it. I like it quite a lot. So that's my quick uh, iOS 10 update. I'm still actually really enjoying iOS 10, although a Apple absolutely has their own problems. So I don't mean yeah. to uh, I don't mean to try to uh, set one platform over the other. I think they're all kind of they're all kind of a, a dumpster fire at the moment. Mr. Dominic, is there anything else on that positive, wonderful note that you would like to contribute before we wrap up to this year's shenanigans? No, uh, just, you know, go to at Dumanuko on Twitter. Bam. Boom, there you go. Also check out Buccaneer Tech. It's on uh, the tweeters as well. And I'll just give a super quick plug. If you're going to be in the Seattle area tomorrow, <laughs> Tuesday, the 27th, Come and say hi. We'll be in downtown Seattle. Send me a tweet. We'll be at the Open Daylight Summit. Wes, Angela, and I uh, interviewing people, learning about software-defined networking, which is a whole new area of development. And uh, maybe I'll bring some experience back to next week's episode if there's anything to share with the class that I think you might find interesting. Be sure to tune in live if you can. You can find it at jupiterbroadcasting.com slash calendar for the live time. JBLive.tv is where you'll watch it live and get to name and suggest and give us real-time follow-up. And coderadio.reddit.com is where you go to send in some links or projects you think we should check out. And coderadio, jupiterbroadcasting.com is where you go to email us. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you right back here next week. <laughs>